Good morning, everybody. How are you feeling this morning? Good. You're at my favorite service, the 1130. Personal favorite, and I didn't tell the 930 that. So uh, I want to just congratulate you because uh, you did it. 16 weeks of Romans. <laughs> we're at the end, chapter 16, and today is our last day where we're going to cover uh, this fabulous book. We could have taken twice as many weeks to do it, probably three times, and because it's so dense, it's so beautiful, it's so wonderful. We'll, what we'll do is take another swing around Romans and it, it, over the next uh, uh, couple years, and we, could t- we can do all new messages from the book of Romans. It's just that good. So anyway, we'll keep doing that from time to time. If you need message notes today, uh, the ushers have them for you, and so just raise your hand, and if you didn't get one when you came in, they will give them to you. Um, so this series has been really interesting because we're talking about life in the Spirit. If they don't see you, just r- wave your hand a little bit more, uh, and they will find you. Um, this series has been really fascinating because, as you recall, I mean, this, this pa- these passages that we've been studying really are about a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a little fledgling group of Jews and Gentiles who became Jesus followers in the cosmopolitan city of Rome. And so there's this little gathering of Christians, first century Jesus followers, and Paul is writing to help them figure out how to live this life, this new life that they've received and they've experienced. And so he gets, he gets to the end, this last chapter, and it's kind of like um, it's kind of like the Apostle Paul is simply saying hi to a bunch of people. Like there's a whole list of people, and he's like, "I want to say hi to this person, say hi to that person. Make sure you say hi to Aunt Molly, and hey, make sure that Uncle Howard gets a, a little handshake and a hug." And he kind of goes, and it feels a little bit like actually an Oscar speech. And I'd like to thank this person and this person and this person. It's kind of like, you know, the Oscar speeches where they start talking and you don't care at all. You just want them to get to the next award. Like, you don't know one of those people. It doesn't matter. And, and, and so it's like, it's like the award for film editing. You just are like, don't care. Move on. Um, that's kind of how you feel about chapter 16 sometimes. But you would be remiss if you did that. It is not a chapter to be skipped. On the surface, it looks like you could just skim over it, but if you dig down a little bit, you will find that these are Paul's final instructions. And that, and that he's, he's ending the letter here, and, and even though the theology has been so rich, he's talked about salvation and sanctification and sovereignty and God's work in our lives and their lives as he was writing these Jesus followers. There's so much about the Jewish people and the Gentiles and how God is putting those people together and what that means for the world and the nations and this, this, whole, this whole book has been so rich with things like the role of the Holy Spirit spirit in our lives, and he gets to the end, and these are the things he wants to say. Final instructions. Kind of like, don't forget this. Don't forget this. It's like a dad who is, um, hadn't seen his kids in a while and is writing them a letter and just wants to say, here's how I want you to behave. Here's, okay, I know you know all this stuff. I know I've taught you all this stuff. You know I've, I've given you all these concepts, but here's how I want you to apply them. And it's like a teacher who, who has all these important concepts, but then it becomes personal for him. Like a friend who's writing a, a letter and finally there's a, an expression of love at the end. And so I want you to see it this way. There's, there's some incredible stuff hidden in these verses. And so let's pray, and then we'll dive into it. Father, we thank you for your word, that it comes alive to us when we read it. And it, and it happens this way because your Holy Spirit is speaking to us, revealing things to us. So would you let the words jump off the page into our hearts? Would you help us to see it, to hear it? and then to act on it, to change, and to obey. We thank you for this and the revelation of it in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Now, if you look at this chapter, you can see that there's, it's broken down into four sections. And there's four sections. There's, there's Paul's commendation, Paul's cordiality, Paul's caution, and Paul's conclusion, right? And you can see that in your message notes. Now, these four, these four areas, you know, they all start with C, so you know they got to be good. So it's a pastor thing. You just have to put everything in, 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 in this kind of order. But you see that these ideas come alive with four points that I want to highlight to you, for you. So the Apostle Paul's commendation. All right, let's look at it. Before we read anything, I want you to fill in the first blank on your message notes because Paul, I believe, is coaching us to appreciate each other. He's coaching us to appreciate each other. All right, let's read it a little bit, Romans 16, 1 through 2. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in uh, Sincrea. I ask you to re- receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been a great help to many people, including me. Now here in these two verses, the Apostle Paul is kind of, he starts with it by bragging on this woman named Phoebe. Now what do we know about Phoebe? Well, first of all, we know she was a woman, obviously, because he says, our sister, Phoebe. She's named after a character on the hit TV show, Friends. (laughs) Just checking if you were listening. No, she's not actually named after that Phoebe. She's named after a Greek goddess. A Greek goddess. She doesn't sing Smelly Cat, but she does represent a Greek goddess. She was a Gentile, most likely. This means she was a Gentile who became a Christian, who became a Jesus follower. We also know that she's from this little village called Sincrea, which was about nine miles south of Corinth, which is another city that Paul visited and and wrote letters to. You can see those in the Bible with the first and second Corinthians because he was writing that church. And so she comes, and finally, we know that, that she delivered this letter for Paul. So she's she's delivering it for him. But ultimately, what I want you to see here is that we know that she was a leader within the church. Look at verse one again. I commend to you, our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in Sincrea. Now, I want you to underline that word servant in that verse. Just take it and underline that word servant. In the original Greek language, this word was diakonos, which means the, where we get the word deacon or deaconess. And, and Phoebe was a, a deaconess of the church in Sincrea, this there, now there's some debate about what that term actually means or what it was, but there is no doubt that she was a leader within the church. She was a leader within the church. Now listen to what Paul says they should do with Phoebe and her ministry. And it's important because Paul kind of gets a bad rap about his idea of women in the church. He's, I think he's misunderstood a lot of times uh, about his view of women. The first thing he says, the Apostle Paul says about Phoebe is accept her. You can write that in your notes right there, accept her. Paul says, I commend to you. And then he says, I ask you to receive her. The word commend in the original language means to approve or to recognize or to recommend. He's recommending her. And then this, the word receive in this, in this verse is, in the original language, it means to accept or to follow, to allow, to allow her. And what Paul is saying here, would you allow her to lead? I recommend this woman. I want you to accept her. I want you to allow her to minister to you. I, I don't belittle her. Don't put her down just because she's a woman. This is a pretty important point for us this morning, today, because for some people, there's this thinking that women can't minister in church or that women can't lead. But here, the Apostle Paul is specifically endorsing the ministry of this woman. And I think it's really important for us to just pause here and understand that that women in our culture, we're going through this major shift in the way that people are 
acting and dealing with this, this kind of subject in American culture. The Me Too movement has sort of elevated this idea in our consciousness. And I want to be careful that we're not saying that men are pigs and women are awesome, <laughs> even though men can be pigs. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> men, you're like just sitting there, just staring at me. <laughs> and the women are like, amen? <laughs> you do realize that the, the problem, the, the, the issue that the Me Too movement is highlighting is the fact that there's an abuse of power. That's really the highlight. It's not really necessarily about men. It's more about the abusiveness of people in positions of power over and over again. And, 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 and these people are being outed. These stories and, 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 and women saying, yeah, that happened to me. Here's what I want to suggest to you, that in one chapel and in the church of Jesus Christ, there should never be abuses of power nor should there be a belittling of women, nor should there be some kind of control or some kind of abuse or, or some kind of just re rejection or resistance to women leading. There should be an embrace to what God has put inside of women for leadership and what God has put inside of every person within our community, including women, and they should be elevated and respected that there should be care and concern about how we treat each other. That includes how men treat women and that includes how women treat men. And I want you to see that that's what Paul is kind of unleashing here. And you can, you can kind of miss it if you just kind of read through and say, oh, he's saying hi to some friends. No, he's actually highlighting a woman who leads and, and challenging them to accept her. Why does he have to do that? Because in, in his day, women were not respected very often. In his day, there was a problem with the way women were treated. And we must be, as a church, countercultural to, to how women are often treated in this day, in our day, in 2018. We need to be the kind of people that understand that all are equal, that God made every one of us with an equality, an inherent value. And that's kind of what Paul's doing here. So the second thing that Paul says about Phoebe is, affirm her. You can write that in your message notes. He's, a, he's affirming her. He's saying, yes, this person, he says, give her any help she may need from you. See, friends, not only were they to accept Phoebe's ministry, but they were also to come alongside her, to help her, to assist her. And that's what all of us need to do because not only do we need to accept other people's ministries, we need to affirm them, support them in any way they can, whether they're male or female. And one chapel believes this. Did you know... Uh, Kim Swafford, she was in the first service. Pastor Kim Swafford is the pastor in charge of One Chapel College, which is the group of people that we believe are called and in investing in a life or a vocational type of ministry. And this, this is a person who influences every person who believes that they're called to go through the training at One Chapel. She's in charge of that. She leads it, and she leads it well. She's an incredible pastor and an incredible person. The welcome party we're about to have right after service, you know, the, the person that leads this is Cindy Street Matter. She's back there getting ready for the welcome party right now. She leads all this, this ministry that welcomes people into the life of the church. She sends e e emails and texts to people. She leads a whole team of people that, that invest in welcoming people into our community. I want you to see that women are respected and valued and elevated at one chapel. And it should never be any different than that. Finally, the Apostle Paul commends her to 
the, the people in Rome when he says to appreciate her, and you've already filled in that blank, but I want to expand on this idea, this appreciation of her a little bit more. The Apostle Paul says in verse 2, she has been a great help. Everybody say help. She's been a great help to many people, including me. Now, let me show you something here in this little passage. All right, are you still with me? All right, this little word help, right, it's, there's so much in that little word that you don't see because we got to peel back a couple layers of original language. The Apostle Paul uses a word here. It's the same word as leadership in Romans 12. Romans 12, verse 6 through 8. Write that in your margin of your message notes. You can check, about, check it out later. That's your homework for this week. Romans 12, 6 through 8. He says, we have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership... Let him govern diligently. That word leadership right there, if it is leadership, that word for the gift of leadership the Apostle Paul uses here in Romans 12 is the same word that the Apostle Paul uses when he says, Phoebe has been a helper to me. What can we conclude by this? Is Phoebe had a gift of leadership, and he was recognizing it. And he was embracing it. Phoebe was a woman who had the gift of leadership. And he was saying, hey, everyone, I've been ministered to by this woman. She's ministered to me and I appreciate who she is. And I want you to appreciate her too. I think the lesson we can learn from these verses, we all need to accept one another. We need to affirm one another. We need to appreciate one another. And, and I, I, I think this portion of scripture essentially highlights that we should do this in relation to women and the women who lead, and the women who serve. If you're a woman that actually is involved in some sort of ministry here at One Chapel, whether it's here at OC or uh, maybe another ministry, if you're on, a, if you're on Team One, uh, serving as a greeter or an usher or a kids for the one uh, a leader or student uh, teacher, a tag, tag student ministries leader or worship or tech or hospitality team or small groups, you lead a small group or you're on the prayer team, these areas of leadership and serving, if you're involved in any of that and, and you're a woman, please stand up right now. Just stand up right now. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, give it, come on, give it to him. Yeah, come on. Come on, stand up. Well, look, now, no, no, just, 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 don't sit down, don't sit down. Look around at these women. Okay, now you can sit down. Now look, look, I shudder to think what would happen to one chapel if these women weren't leading. I just think we have to recognize it. We have to understand that we're called to be countercultural. We're called to appreciate one another. I just want to dig in on this real quick. Appreciating one another. You know, you understand that there's people all over this church this morning who are doing things that need appreciation. You know, there's coffee out front. You know, we don't have elves making that stuff. There are men and women who made that stuff, who set things up in the hallway. There are people right now in the ch children's ministry, and they're teaching your kids. What I want us to be as a church is not a church that just kind of, you come into church, you kind of see it as a consumer experience. Oh, I get this, and I get that, and I just, oh, it wasn't very good today. Oh, Pastor Ross, he really needs to work on his messages. You know, whatever, <laughs> you kind of get into this thing, and you're like, you see it only through the lens of what you get. There should be a, a sense of appreciation for the, the things that are being poured out all over this church body. And I want you to see it. I want you to lift your eyes from yourself and be grateful. Look, everybody knows this principle. When you go to a restaurant or you go to some uh, place where you want to give them a, um, a review, right? And, if the, and, and, and Yelp reviews have sort of become famous, right? But if it's a bad experience, it's 10 times more likely you're going to write it. If it's a good experience, it's only, only two or three people out of, out, out of a time will tell about their good experiences. Listen, we need to be countercultural in this regard. We are, we are appreciating people. 
And even when we see them struggle, we appreciate their effort. We appreciate their giving. We appreciate who they are. Second section of the chapter is about Paul's cordiality, which essentially means he, he wants people to be cordial. He's being cordial to them, and he's articulating these people who have been cordial and, and connected to him. And so that brings us to point number two, which is know each other's stories. You gotta know each other's stories. Do you wanna be a church that actually has real power and authority, you have to be involved in each other's stories. Paul says here, now we're gonna go through a huge section of scripture, so get your, get your Bible out, or if you, if you have a device, turn on your Bible and go to Romans 16, because we're gonna read this whole thing here, and I'm gonna pronounce some really tricky words. Ready? Verse three, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. Greet my dear friend Eponidas, who was first, the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Greet Mary, and who worked very hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junius, who, my relatives who have been in prison with me. They're outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Greet Ampelitus, whom I love in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my dear friend Stachus. Greet Apelles, tested and approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the household of Aristobulus. Oh, that was a good one. Greet Herodian, my relative. Greet those in the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. Greet Trophanian and Blikissimidurbi and those women... <laughs> and those women who work hard in the Lord. Greet my dear friend Persis, another woman who has worked very hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother who has been a mother to me too. Greet Asuncretus and Phlegon and Hermos and Petrobus, Hermes and the brothers with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Nerus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints with them, greet one another with a holy kiss. What? <laughs> greet one another. I don't want anyone to underline that verse. Don't just... <laughs> All the churches of Christ send greetings, and then you go down to verse 21. Go down to verse 21. Um, it says, Timothy, my fellow worker, sends his greetings to you, as do Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater. Uh, my relatives, I, Tertius, who wrote down this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaos, his hospitality, and I, and the whole church here in joy, sends you his greetings. Erastos, his, who is the city's director of public works, and our brother, Quartus, send you their greetings. Oh. Come on, I did pretty good, didn't I? I mean, it was okay. It wasn't great, but it was all right. The, 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 the real trick is just speed. Just speed through it. Now, there's a couple of things that impressed me in this passage, and I, I, I want to I wanna highlight them. First thing is, I want to say it again, the number of women that he highlights here, you just miss it if you just read through it, but the number of women that Paul mentions here is significant, and here's why it's significant. Now listen to me. You'd be hard-pressed to find another piece of literature from written during this time period that mentions as many women in a positive light or a positive note as this single passage does. And I just want to highlight the fact that Jesus was constantly breaking barriers of his day and elevating those who were ca uh, outcasts of society. Whether it was a, 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 a woman who was, not, who was mistreated or it was a person who had leprosy who you weren't supposed to touch, Jesus was always busting through those barriers. Paul, I believe, is saying something here to his church in Rome and he's writing from a context that we should understand what he thinks about this what he thinks about these relationships, what he believes, how he treats people, all people. And so the second thing that impresses me is the fact that Paul actually knew all these people. That he knew all these people. There are 35 names mentioned in this chapter plus other references to unnamed people. Eight of those were people 
who worked with the Apostle Paul at Corinth, which is that other city. 27 of those were people in Rome, plus he mentions a couple households. He, he runs through it in his mind. Here's the thing. He knew them by name, which says to me the Apostle Paul was a people person. He, had, he valued people. See, church family, listen, this, this should say something to us. We need to be the kind of people who don't wear masks to church, that we don't just interact with on a sort of a casual basis with people within one chapel, that we need to learn how to connect with each other. And it's hard in our day, the busyness, the pace, I understand you're fighting some battles in your life. The issue is you can win those battles if you'll have more people who know about them, who are walking with you, who are helping you. Look, this, su this supper for six thing is an opportunity for you. This summer, you can either invest in some relationships and see the fruit of it next fall, or you can just skip it and keep to yourself, go on your vacation, and be stressed out when you try to hit the fall when everything comes back around and school starts again. And you, do you see the problem? You gotta decide. You gotta decide. This, this, these uh, little things are on every other seat and you can fill it out if you're looking for a group or if you wanna lead a group, a bunch of you should be leading this group because listen, we've gotta be countercultural in the way that things are all around us. Here's what brilliant author T.S. Eliot wrote in a play. It was actually a play called The Cocktail Party. And he, here's what he says. He says, the reason the cocktail glass has become so important is because the communion cup has lost its meaning. It's pretty profound. The communion cup represents a special relationship in which people become close in fellowship and yet are most fully themselves. Here's, here's, what, here's what one chapel is supposed to be. Here's what the big C church is supposed to be. is a place where you can be fully yourself and people know and they're okay. They're going to walk with you. They're going to work with you. <laughs> Some of you are sitting here saying, well, I don't want to know those people. <laughs> I totally get that. It's like suddenly you realize, oh, you mean I can't be in charge of people that I should reach out to? Oh, you mean Jesus might ask me to do something for someone or with someone who I might be a little uncomfortable with? Yes. You know why? Because you need to grow. You need to grow in your unselfishness. You and I, we all do. And so I'm not saying you have to spend all your time with people you don't like. <laughs> I'm just saying from time to time it will happen and you shouldn't freak out like, I can never go back to that small group. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Did you see how arrogant that dude was? You met him one time and you think he's arrogant. Problem may not be his. <laughs> I'm just saying... I'm just saying, I just feel like we just, it's like we, we, we have a hard time being willing to sort of give this a thing, give this a chance. Now, if you, when you came in, you signed a name tag and put it on. I forgot mine this morning. Sorry. Some of you resisted purposefully because you don't like it. <laughs> do you know why we do name tags? It's not because after service, I'm going to show you a pyramid scheme. It's because... It's because, you're not at a business convention, it's because name tags actually take away the first barrier to knowing someone. You can move on to the second thing, which is something about them, who they actually are. And you can see their name so you can remember it. You know why names are so important? Here's why. Because there's a story behind every name. And you need to know those stories. You need to tell your story. third thing that impresses me about this thing is these stories, so many people, each name tag represents a story, but here in, in one chapel, but Paul, as he's talking to these people in Rome, there, there's a, a fascinating story about Priscilla and Aquila I just want to highlight to you. Verse three and four says, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow 
workers in Christ Jesus. They risk, check this out, they risk their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful for them. These people went out of their way to make sure that Gentile churches were included, and they risked their lives for Paul and for the gospel. Now, Priscilla and Aquila are mentioned six times in the New Testament. And what's interesting about this is typically in those days, because it was a chauvinistic society, the, the, the man was always mentioned first. But here, it's kind of like Mr. and Mrs., right? Okay, but, but here in the scriptures, four out of the six times in the New Testament, Priscilla is mentioned first. Priscilla and Aquila, before, she's mentioned before her husband. Most scholars believe that that simply means Priscilla was the stronger of the two teachers. The stronger personality or the, even maybe the stronger giftedness of her as a teacher. In other words, she was the more out front person. And here in these verses, the Apostle Paul says, they have helped me. They were co-workers with me. He said, not one of them was. He said, they were both of them. And I think this provides us a good example of how husbands and wives can work together. Now, one of the places in the New Testament is Acts 18, where we kind of uncover a little of their story. Look at Acts 18, 24 to 26. I'll put it up on, on the screen. It says, Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. In other words, the guy wasn't a real strong Christian. He was a Jesus follower, but he, everything he knew about Jesus, he knew, uh, he knew a lot about John the Baptist, but he knew a little bit about Jesus. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, verse 26 says, when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. That's kind of cool. In other words, Priscilla and Aquila took this man in. They, they said, hey, oh, you're so good. This is so awesome. Why don't you come to our house and let us enlighten you? <laughs> this, this, this speaks about Priscilla and Aquila and what kind of people they were. Do you think they invited him to their house and then started beating up on him? No, that's not what history says either. History says he became an incredible leader in the church at Corinth. And partly because of the investment of Priscilla and Aquila. And there was an investment in their lives. They, they risked their lives. Their, this story of who they are, Paul was articulating stories. You and I don't have any fabric with our community at one chapel. Or frankly, for that matter, with the Austin community if we don't have stories. If we don't share stories. Stories are the glue by which communities get together. And this is, this is part of the problem is people are so transient that they don't have time for stories. And even the stories they have had, they don't want to share them for fear of shame or, or pain or, 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 you know, something else. And they don't realize there's healing in it. And there's, there's this, this wonderful thing that the Holy Spirit does when people get together and they share their story and you realize you're not alone you realize you're, you're not the only person who's experienced this and somebody else speaks into your life and it's incredible what can happen. But it's scary to do it the first time. I want us to be a church that's willing to know each other's stories. The, the third section of this chapter is Paul's caution and number three is don't allow division. Don't allow division Romans 16, 17 through 20 says, I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I am full of joy over you, but I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. Oh, that's worth underlining right there. I want, you, I want you to be innocent about what is evil. We are so judgmental. We are so critical. We are so sensitive that we just see everything through the lens of evil. I want you to be innocent of those things. If that arrogant guy that you go to supper for six with, go the second week and be willing to think the best about him. 
and realize that he has a story that may have made him the way he is. That he may actually be in process too, just like you. And he may actually need someone to help him through that process who would, might be honest enough and make the investment of time where he could realize that he's giving off a false self and that this isn't who he's called to be or maybe it's you that are overly sensitive and after two or three meals together you're like, oh, I really like this guy. Well, what was that about? You see the problem. Oh, you're saying to me, Pastor Ross, I'm kind of a busy person. <laughs> yeah, you and everybody else. Paul's describing a culture and a community that I think we have to reflect to not allow division. And let me tell you this, all the hard work, one of the cornerstone verses of one chapel is speaking the truth in love it's Ephesians 4.15. Speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow into him who is the head, Christ Jesus. Now listen, what does this mean? This means speaking the truth and love both have to happen in order for people to grow. I know we all want to gravitate to one or the other. Truth, hey, I got some truth for you, pal. You really got problems. Boom. Or you go the other direction, I just, we just, I just want to love you. Just, we, we just, can't we just all get along? And we never tell the truth to each other. Let me tell you this. All the work, all the work, all the time must be invested in creating an atmosphere, and env an environment where love spills out, where, where we convince people we love them so that when you tell them the truth, they don't doubt your motives. All the work is in building an atmosphere, and that must be done intentionally. You don't do that without stories. You don't do that without elevating unity and squashing, de-escalating fights and conflict. de -escal I'm not saying you can't have fights. Look, <laughs> I have five kids. Fight is, fighting is part of the family. <laughs> it's just part of the way it is. You get a, where two or three are gathered in my name, there's more than one opinion. And this is the problem. This is the problem. So you, listen, church life is part, there's, there's gonna be fighting, there's gonna be some conflict, there's gonna be some whining and complaining. I see it in my house all the time. And, and we train each other, we encourage each other, we challenge one another, we confront one another, but listen, we gotta make sure the investment is happening where we're loving one another, caring for one another. Don't allow dissension. Don't, he said, Paul says, stay away from those who cause division. Promote harmony. Don't listen to complaints and division. Don't be part of it. It's, it does nothing but tear things down. I'm not talking about meaningful things that must be discussed. Like I said, confronting must happen. Challenges must be faced. But, but those who cause people to tear apart and division, he says, you need to be careful. And I think this is an incredible point because Jesus, he's echoing what Jesus said in John 17 in his prayer when he said, Father, make them one like you and I are one. He said that with a reason, so the world will believe that you sent me because when any of us agree, it's a miracle. He wanted a oneness, a unity. He's echoing Psalm 133 that says, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. There's a, there's a power for it. But listen, here's the thing. Unity only really finds its strength in diversity. Unity only finds its strength through diversity. Don't try to make everybody like you. Oh, well, if they really wanted to be a great leader, they should. Don't, I, you, listen, you, I don't want you to do everything like me. I want you to do everything like God made you. <laughs> How horrible this church would be if it had a lot of mini-me's. <laughs> it would be terrible. I mean, it'd be good for a while, but then you get sick of it. The, 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 there's, it's not about being a man or being a woman or being at the top of the economic scale or being at the bottom of the economic social ladder. It's not about your, your politics or any of that. What Paul says is maintain a banner of unity over your life and don't accentuate these other things because diversity has to happen, right? Diversity actually 
we need to honor it. We need to, we need to, we need to understand the differences between us. And then we need to learn what Jesus meant by becoming one. And what it means is nobody has to suffer from their greatest weakness because somebody around you has a strength that you need. If we're all the same, that's no power in unity. Everybody who thinks the same and acts the same, and, and that, that's weird. That's like a cult. But what is powerful is a group of people who understand there are some differences, and Jesus is the banner over those differences. That love covers all those things. That there is a unifying process that we're about, that we're not tearing down, that we're building up. And then finally, the final uh, part of this chapter is the Apostle Paul's conclusion, which brings us to number four, remember your purpose. He's writing this letter and he says, remember your purpose. Verse 25 says, now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, this mystery, you know what he's talking about in mystery? His mystery that he's talking about to these people is the mystery of the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers coming together. He's saying this is the point for which Christ came to bring everyone together to make sure that the nations know who God is. Verse 26, he says, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God so that all nations might believe and obey him. That's the great purpose of our church. That's the great purpose of the Big C Church. God leaves us here in, on earth when we come to him. Right? Wouldn't it be so much nicer if you came to Jesus, you prayed the prayer, oh Jesus, I'll follow you, I surrender to you, amen. Boom, you just went to heaven. So much simpler. But instead, he leaves us here. Why? He leaves us here because he's interested in forming you and shaping you for the future. He's interested in you understanding what is coming in the age, the new age, the new heaven and the new earth, and he wants you to start practicing that way of living. And in fact, he wants you to bring his kingdom to the planet in collaboration with him. That's what we're doing here. We're collaborating with God in his great purpose. And I want you to see that God's great purpose is always, always found in bringing people closer. Closer to two things. His purpose is always bringing people closer to himself and closer to each other. The world wants to divide us from him. Do you know that God, his problem, the problem he sent Jesus to solve wasn't sin, it was separation. The problem Jesus came to solve is being separated. People, humanity being separated from God. That's the problem he came to solve and he's drawing people to himself. And you know what else he's doing? He's drawing people together. He's draw, it, no longer letting division define them. And it's interesting because we need diversity but we don't, we can never surrender to division. And God calls us to a life where this last part of Romans, it describes it so that all the nations might believe and obey him. And then verse 27, he says, to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. And that, my friends, is the book of Romans. Now listen, now listen. I want you just to close your eyes and bow your head right here. I, I want you to open your heart to what the Holy Spirit might say to you real quickly. In our, in our last moments as we come to the Lord's table. And maybe you've been hurt, maybe you've been wounded, maybe, maybe there are circumstances that have been so painful to you that even me saying and talking about some of these things in the way in which I, I have, have kind of poked something in your heart. And I just would ask you to respond to that respond to the, the work of God's spirit who wants to heal your heart. Maybe there's division between you and another person. God wants, to, God wants to take that and he wants to lead you maybe even into a process where you're united with a brother or a sister. 
Maybe you've realized as I've been talking that this is a moment for you to surrender to the great purpose that you have in your life, caring for others and loving them and helping them be drawn to Jesus. As we come to this table, I want you to see yourself as receiving the great healing that comes from the broken body of Jesus, his brokenness for your wholeness. Come and and touch this piece of bread and dip it in this cup, the bread that represents his body and the the cup that represents the forgiveness and and the washing away of sins, the washing away of the past, the washing away of the hurt. Let him do that to you today, in you. And I want you to even even go one step further with this table that we come to and see yourself as part of the body of Christ. And as you pick up one little piece of bread, you realize, oh, this is me. And I belong to all the others and I'm connected to all the others and and I want to be. So Lord, dip me in your blood and forgive me and cleanse me and heal me and let me start anew again today. Let me yield to your body, to being who you say I am. Father, we just invite you to speak to us and we invite you to lead us and we invite you to to help us. There is nothing we can do in and of ourselves that can change these things we've been talking about. We, We must have the power of God to see our hearts and minds transformed. Would you accomplish that now as we come to the table? as we come face to face with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.